Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Being uh, 6.45, we can <coughs> call us meeting to order. The first item of the agenda is the uh, acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Walk-in period. Anyone? Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. Yep. Yeah, all three, please. If you would do, uh, if you would introduce yourself for the for the minutes, it would make Craig it easy. Lane, yep. Avenue. Craig Fritz, 11 Mitchell Avenue. Jack Foot, the 13 Mitchell Avenue. Yep. Uh, All yours. <laughs> sure. Oh, I know where it is. All yours. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I didn't have much time to prepare, so if I just read the statement, then probably go quicker. Yeah, I just just the, the ground rules. If I get it, it's going to be. Much more than five minutes, we've got a problem. Okay, that's the only, that's our. I'll try to move along. Okay, thank you. Okay, despite uh, stated policy of public involvement, such a <coughs> decision to keep the Musquash Creek Pond Gates continuously open was made without input from or consideration of the abutters. We brought this atten to this attention, uh, this to the attention of the DPW, Conservation, and CBM, CZM people, the ones involved, and have received no response. Our other neighbor, Robert Vogel, who Zale can't be here this evening. Has been trying to get us a hearing uh, with the selectmen since September, and we never seem to make it onto the agenda. Uh, now we're just two weeks away from the Conservation Commission hearing for a new proposal where they uh, propose to remove completely the electric gates, and so we don't feel we can wait any longer. We, uh, we have two issues to raise here this evening. The first is the negative impacts of the gate openings on our lives in terms of quality of life, property values, Diminished aesthetics and loss of recreation. And the failure, the second point is the failure of the DPW department in the past to execute an effective pond flushing plan as they were directed to by the selectmen in the past. Once they failed in that execution of their plan, the plan was blamed rather than the execution of the plan. And now a new drastic course of action has been taken. The nature of the problem has been that due to the uh, tide cycles and the depth of the pond, Sediments, which are typically two to three feet deep at the north end of the pond, are continuously <coughs> exposed for each month for a week or more. This is a large area of like five to ten acres, which produces an awful stench, especially during the hotter months in the summer. As presented by the, the uh, people who came up with this plan, it doesn't sound bad. You simply open the gates and let nature take its course. The tide will just come in and go out twice each day and make everything better. But the truth is, Daily tide cycles only change the, about the top foot of water of the tide. Um, uh, the water level only changes about a foot during the daily tide. But the bigger factor is the monthly tide cycles 
uh, the spring and neap tides, which vary about three feet each month. This means that once the tides reach the lower part of their monthly cycles each month, the neap tides, the incoming water level is not sufficient to cover large areas of the pond's floor. It leaves the sediments exposed, ugly, and reeking. Exposing the mud is necessary for a good flush, but it serves no purpose to leave it exposed once the pond is emptied. As it is now, it, the water goes out and stays that way for a week or better. And I can't describe the stink to you. You'd have to witness it. Uh, <coughs> as to the negative impacts of, on the, uh, uh, of, this, of this problem, uh, first of all, the property values, and, uh, where we once had uh, a pond and water and sunset reflecting off the water. We now have got water, a uh, full pond for about a week a month. And then for another week of the month, we've got a mud flat. And then the other two weeks, it goes, varies back and forth in between as the, as the tide rises and falls. Uh, if any of us had, uh, we're trying to sell our homes, and we had a prospective buyer come to look at our houses and that water was out, that would affect negatively the price of our homes at tens of thousands of dollars. <coughs> We have a measurable, we are, we are suffering measurable damages here. Uh, as to recreation, many of us are on the pond, own canoes or kayaks, I own both, and we can no longer use them because we can no longer reach the water. So the water is, we got, we let got, me, we let, got let me, mind. if I may interrupt, yeah. and I thank you, but just, and in, in, uh, the reason that we, we have, con the reason that you're, you've not come before the selectmen, maybe this will, put some direction to this. You know, we have people who are experts in this, and those people aren't us, right? They're the Conservation Commission and the, the DPW. Uh, I think there's a DPW uh, a conservation hearing. February 2nd, I think. February 2nd, in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably your, your avenue to voice your concerns, because we, I mean, there's nothing we can do here. Uh, it's, it's, we, we're not about to, to, uh, intercede, I don't believe, in any conservation matters. That would be something just completely out of our, uh, out of our domain. It's been our impression that they've been notifying this body and they've been going forward with their blessings. And yeah, with whose blessings? With this, the selectmen's blessings. I'd be willing to guess the selectmen haven't, we haven't discussed this in any way, shape, or form. How can we, how can we get that discussion underway? There are a number of things that Craig didn't have to I would suggest about. that if anyone on the board has a different idea, chime in. Joe, <clears throat> I thought a while ago these gates were supposed to be open and closed once a month had to do with the, the full moon tides. That's what I thought. Now, you, can I just ask a question? I was going to ask you just one quick question. They're open and they're left open all the they're time? Open. Yes. And, and that's the problem? They've been left open in that position for over a year now. Another right. adverse effect is the past two days the tide's been very high and the pond floods into people's yards because the gates are open. The past two days have been managed. Okay. Initially, they were managed manually. I think we spent about $70,000 to electrify the gates mm -hmm. so they are now sure. uh, uh, under electric motor control. Rick. And um, Go ahead, Rick. there was talk about spending 12000 on an automated system so no labor would be involved and the pond would be regulated as it used to be. Rick, if I could just follow up with a point of, point of uh, information here. Um, Vinny Kalicious, the conservation agent, uh, in consultation with uh, Coastal Zone Management, consultation with the entire Conservation Commission, with the Town Administrator, the DPW, and several other uh, departmental bodies, held a public, well-announced meeting about the Musquashica Pond last year. So when you start off by saying that there was no opportunity for consultation with the Butters, that's just not accurate. Um, secondly, this is a long, involved conversation that's been going on. Um, most recently, uh, Trisha Vincasey, the town administrator, went down to D DEP and met with DEP about them. I believe Mr. Kalicious was there and or Mr. Bangert, I'm not exactly sure. Um, this is the, the reason why the gates have been left open now is because it's been upon recommendation from consultants as well as uh, in collaboration and recommendation from the state uh, um, coastal zone management group. And um, this is because it, it is, falls under the classification of a state pond, if I 
or a great pond. I'm not exactly sure of the of the real denomination. Great, great pond. Great thank pond. you. And thank you, sir. Um, so uh, this is not something that's been done surreptitiously in the middle of the night. It is, in fact, what the experts, and particularly <coughs> the state coastal zone management, is requiring us to do. Um, and while there are certainly uh, positive aspects for the overall health of the of the pond, there are also um, some negative aspects. One of the positive aspects, for example, is that the midge problem is now going to be ameliorated because of the salt water is going to be effectively poisoning the midges. They were there because of the fresh water not being allowed to drain in and out. So there's a lot of pluses and minuses on this. Personally, I'd be glad to continue a conversation at some time sharing this, these thoughts. Again, there's clearly a lack of information getting out, and perhaps that's you know, no one's particular fault one way or the other, but we could do a better job of that. I would recommend that before we put them on the agenda, we could have these gentlemen. I'd be glad to meet with them. I don't want to put any town official on the spot, but I think that you know I'd be glad to meet with them along with anybody that uh, the town administrator feels would be appropriate um, to you know further educate and find out where some of the hesitancies continue to be. Perhaps there are some things we can do to improve, but frankly, some things we're not going to be able to improve. But I do think we can do a better job communicating these. Um, to you folks Communication well. at this point has been one way. Well, why don't we do this? Because now we're well beyond the time of that walk-in period. Well, Mr. Murray has volunteered, uh, and we thank him for that, to, to sit down with whomever, uh, whoever from, from the Squashka Pond area himself and whoever is designated from, from the town, some from DPW probably, and talk it over in a... Uh, in a How's that sound? That's good. We'll start. We'll start off with that. Okay. I'll definitely need some some backup help from the town at some point on this, but um, let's let's. Uh, Would you, let's if you'd leave your just leave a, uh, your name, whoever Rick spoke, should co uh, contact with Kim Donovan. An email address. Mm -hmm. An email address. Email address. Yeah. And uh, we'll set it up. Great. Thank you. We'll start the dialogue. Thank you for coming in. If you just give that to Kim, would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, next item is recreation. Meet the applicant. Recreation. We're looking for Eric. Eric, uh, Eric, how are you? How are you doing? Good. 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 Nice to meet you guys. Eric, it's uh, been our procedure to have the applicant come in, say hello, yep. introduce yourself, and give us a little bit of background. And uh, my name is Eric <coughs> Richmond. I live on Apple Tree Lane. Uh, my wife and I have been in Situate for about eight years. Uh, we have two children, a five-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy. They've uh, both been in a bunch of the rec department programs and uh, just been awesome. And, uh, you know, I'd like to become more involved in my community, and, and I thought with the rec department I could uh, I could – I could offer a lot of help. John, Thank you. Yeah, so that's great. We actually encouraged him to think about applying. So I'm so happy that you came oh, forward yeah. and so did. Anyway, Thank you. He was, Thank just, you. Just, just say one thing, Eric was at the last record meeting that I was at, and uh, thank you for stepping mm. up to the plate. It was nice to meet yeah, you guys. Good. It was. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Uh, we're going to make the appointment, Eric, later on in the night, but no but there will be no problem. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Eric. All right, thank you for coming in. And Maybe. it's an associate, an associate position. position. Yeah. position. Yep. Uh, class 2 license Shell Station, Front Street. Yeah. Sir, if you would just come up. Thank you. Again, would you just, your name and... Okay, my name's uh, Lou Mazzoni. Uh, we just bought a uh, Shell station on Front Street, and uh, we're looking to get a Class II license mainly for internet purposes only. There wouldn't be any for sale signs on the cars. We're just looking for a two-car uh, two car license. Okay. Discussion from the board? 
Where, where do you tend to, I know, so you're looking to, a class two license is to sell, okay, right. so that people exactly. understand. So you're going to be looking to have two vehicles on the site on Front Street? Yes. And whereabouts are you looking to kind of showcase or at least have the vehicles? So uh, that would be set back. Uh, there's really only one section by where the tanks are. Yeah. Uh, that would, they, they both would be displayed there, so they wouldn't be displayed anywhere on the side, just right, right beside the building. Right beside the building, there's like, there's like, I don't know, 10 slots there, and we just have two far off to the left. Now, are these vehicles that are being purchased, or I assume by, and I, is, are you Lewis? I'm yes. Sorry. Are, you, are, um, are they being purchased by either, I, I don't want to say by you, but whatever company you're working for, is that it? Yes. Yeah, yes. In other words, you're not going to have people come and say, I'm going to sell my car there, no. and then you... No, absolutely okay. not. We don't, first of all, we don't have the, the space for it. Second of all, we don't do that. Okay. Just not good business. Will you will you have signs? I mean, uh, no. uh, flyers or uh, balloons? Or no, no, no. I've had gas stations in Pembroke for years, and uh, it was in the center protection zone, and they really frowned on any of that kind of stuff. So you know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're yeah, talking thank about. Thank you. Yeah. I, and the reason why I ask is because I obviously it's a it's a filling station, gas station. It's it, it's well maintained. It looks great. Yeah. I, I just would hate to see the kind of turning into a much more of a tackier exactly. location exactly. I, I know but on the other hand because of business uh, i also am acutely aware of that you know trying to make more or try to complement right. or supplement your money get. i totally understand that so how are people going to know that cars are for sale there uh internet oh, okay. all through we um oh, yeah, okay yep. further discussion from the board joe yeah. i just in the motion's a little different than what he said that do you want me to oh, do you want to try and <clears throat> no i you know I, that's all right dan i mean uh, john do you want to Try and, or I can, move the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a Class II <coughs> license to Lewis Mazzoni, DBA Situate Shell, Inc., at 141 Front Street Situate, um, with no vehicles to be displayed for sale on the premises. Uh, proof of bond is required uh, under the restriction of not putting any on Front Street itself but set back and without the use of banners and balloons and that sort of right marketing material and a, a limitation of two vehicles yeah, and a limitation of two vehicles yeah. again not trying to just no I understand the whole point we don't have the room for any more than two anyway really don't further second, second. motion be made and second of further discussion on the floor all in favor aye aye, aye. Oh. aye. thank Good you <coughs> All right, thank you very much. Good luck. Good luck. The next item is a discussion. It's a uh, deals with the <coughs> Wampatec School fa Facility Study Approvals. And part of the, the uh, what we have to do is we have to read in its entirety <laughs> aloud the Massachusetts School Building Authority's initial compliance certification. Uh, it is rather lengthy, if anybody would like to. Just the motion. So this is a good time to switch channels to uh, see what's going on in the election. What I'm asking... Uh, Point of order. Yes. Um, Dr. Martin's here, and she informs me that you only have to read the first paragraph. The first wow. paragraph. That's an italicized. Five members have read the entire document. I'm sure they have. Just the first paragraph needs to be read, and then the motion as written. The first paragraph under number one uh, are no. the... The initial compliance. So why don't I do that right now then? Uh, the initial compliance certification must uh, certification must be completed by all eligible applicants who have submitted a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the MSBA, and have been invited to collaborate with the MSBA on a feasibility study or a project scope in budget conference. The MSBA will not consider a district to be eligible for a school building renovation or construction grant until the district has properly submitted an initial compliance certification to the satisfaction of the, of the MSBA. And that's, uh, we've all read this, we all understand it. Uh, a committee will be formed down the road. Uh, doesn't have to be named here tonight. Norman. Uh, it will be available for the public to read it. Yes, the, the, yep, in fact, you can have it right at the end of the meeting. You can have one of our copies. Okay. Discussion? Discussion from the board? I was going to say, do you want a motion, Please. Mr. Chair? Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to accept the Massachusetts School Building Authorities, that's the MSBA, initial compliance certification document in accordance with the following. That was previously read. Second. 
Uh, there's further discussion from the board? From the floor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. It's unanimous. There is a, uh, uh, a further motion that we'll do maybe at the next meeting or the meeting after naming the, the, the members of the school building uh, committee. So why don't we put that on the agenda for next time, Kim, if, the, if uh, those people have been chosen. If not, we'll make it for the time after, but hopefully next meeting. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Go vote, go vote. Hurry up. <laughs> Early and often. Uh, I want a contract for iron pipe and fittings for Roses Lane. Kevin? How are we doing? <coughs> How are you tonight? Good. Um, as you are aware, we were doing the sewer work on Roses Lane. We discovered we had very poor water pipes. Um, we came before the board to request uh, funding to replace those lines. Um, basically, the next two items, one is we put out to bid the material work for all the pipes so that we could purchase all the pipe. Um, the low bidder was $41,352.76, which was Ferguson Water Works, Sumner, and Dunbar. Um, and his bid tabulations um, attached to the work that you have, or the uh, sheets that you have. So we're looking for approval to issue them a purchase order to purchase the pipe and get started with the project. Uh. Kevin, just one quick question. Is this just to purchase the actual pipage? This is just to purchase this is the, the materials. Pipe and the fittings. Yep. We're, okay. we're purchasing it ourselves. And then yes. the next one is the change order the to next do one the work. The change order with the contractor to do the work. Yep. So this is in the amount of uh, 41,000. 41, Move uh, that the Board of Selectmen vote to award the contract for ductile iron pipe and fitting, contract <coughs> number 10 19, to Ferguson Waterworks Sumner and Dunbar of Canton, Massachusetts for a total bid price of $41,352.76 with payment to be made at the unit prices and or lump sum prices. Second. Further discussion from the board? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Kevin. Next. Uh, the next one was the second item, which is for the actual installation of the pipe. Um, we have a contractor who is out there now with his Fed Corp, which has been a good contractor and has a decent reputation in town. Um, we have solicited prices from them to install the water pipe. The reason, um, the big reason why we would like them to install the pipe is they own, as part of their contract, repaving the road. If we had a different contractor come in and do the work, then that would void the warranty for the road work itself. So we're able, mm -hmm. to, we were able to negotiate with them and come up with that price. So that's, uh, that's the reasoning for that. And their price was $77,500. Again, this is the, to actually do the work. We know FedCorp, Sean? Just, uh, I didn't ask this question earlier when I was talking to you, Kevin. That should be the price. I mean, the details and all of this other stuff that's not that included. That does not include the police details. Jeez, constantly in Rose's Lane, do we really? We're not gonna have to have Molly. We had them for the sewer work. There were a lot of school kids going by, um, and we have excavators digging. Yeah, that's true. And you don't right. want to have a right. kid going right. behind a machine. It's, right, that's you know. true. All right. Okay. But it'll be pretty close to the 77. But. Tony? It'd be 77 plus, you know, whatever whatever the details cost. I, I'm i thinking it would take probably four weeks to do the work, so you're looking at, you know, 20 detail shifts. And with this... Would the water pipe go in the same trench as the sewer pipe? No, it has to be a 10 foot separation between the two pipes. Um, so there, be, there would be a separation. Two the different idea trenches. Is we keep the old pipe in, in use, and then we put the new pipe in, and then slowly switch the services over and have both pipes up and running at the same time. Well, they, um, their price includes disinfection, tying into the mains with new tees, and um, running new corporations with new sections of service up to the old services. The homeowner will be responsible to go to the? The homeowner the isn't affected at all. all right. um, basically, it's gonna be a corporation that goes from, say, the one-inch copper right. to another spool piece of one-inch copper that'll right. tie in and go into the new pipe. Okay. And, and just for the record, this doesn't affect the tax betterment at all for anybody that's coming out of the water funds um, to do this work. So 
Oh, it's coming out of the enterprise fund. It's coming out of the enterprise fund. Nothing to do with the betterment. We, we're looking at it. If we don't do it now and we repave the roads five years well, from now, we could have water breaks and you know. You, well, you couldn't do it unless oh, we it was could be ripping it up. Yeah, we could be ripping the road up. So we're, we're doing it at a reduced cost right now. We're piggybacking it. Okay. Motion. Move that the Board of Slackman vote to award the change order for the installation of the water line on Ross, uh, Rosas Lane, contract number 09-WW-01 to FedCorp of Dedham, Massachusetts for a total price of $77,500. Second. Motion to be made and seconded. Further discussion from the Board, from the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, agenda item number eight, uh, budgets and articles. Rick Murray, would you start this off while I go get the budget book? Uh, Thank you. Uh, first, we <coughs> fish. Joe, Joe how are you? I was looking down. I thought you had left. No, okay. <laughs> sorry. Kim was, Kim was kind enough to say she right. should get it. Uh, uh, to you, Mr. Norton. Joe, uh, what we've been doing uh, as we go along here is if, if, if the uh, department head would read the mission statement. Do you have the mission statement? I do. You do. If you would read that and give all of us a, a better handle on exactly what you do. Shellfish Department's mission is to foster, protect, and preserve the town of Scituate shellfish resources and habitats in accordance with federal, state, and local statutes and regulations. Thank you. I love that. Joe's been working for 30-odd years. 30 years, mostly on the North River, uh, patrolling, uh, being our eyes out there. Any questions from the board? The uh, one thing i just like to point out, I was... Um, I need some education of this myself, and so I spoke to Mark Patterson earlier this evening, and he did point out that much of what Joe's work is is, is upstream of the, of the bridge in many cases, which is an area that we don't, Power Master doesn't get up there, so it's really important, and the, the good work that he does there is an yep. area that we just don't, yep. we don't patrol much other than him, so <coughs> it's really great that we have this service, and you're doing a great job, so keep it up. Can you give us some statistics? The only time we hear about what you do is when it's closed. You know, when the okay. Uh, the, state, <laughs> the state determines the opening and closing. Right. Uh, unfortunately, the past several years we've had a red tide that's come in uh, sometime in May, and then exit sometime in you know September or October. This year it came in uh, right about the end of the clamming season, end of May, and uh, they didn't open it up again until September 4th. Uh, but the flats themselves, the most productive ones we have are in the North River. Mm -hmm. Uh, the good ones are really only accessible with a kayak or a boat, although at super low tides you can walk across the third cliff if you want to take the chances. Uh, the no north end, Bassings Beach, has selfish resources, but they've been pretty much played out, so that area hopefully is going to come back on its own. We've tried a little bit of transplanting, but it's been relatively unsuccessful. As a matter of fact, they've tried transplanting uh, seed sets last winter in the uh, North River, and uh, those didn't take too well either. Soft shell clams are really finicky, so you sort of depend upon Mother Nature as far as the spat and the conditions. But uh, we have the North River opened based upon pollution from December 1st <coughs> until the end of June, uh, barring red tide or any other pollution events. Mm -hmm. uh, the area is very susceptible to rainfall events, so if there's a extraordinary, like you get a couple of inches of rain, there seems to be pollutants that uh, go downstream in usually three or five days. And the state, if they happen to test at that time, they test every two weeks as it is, uh, would issue a closure. And one of our responsibilities is to you know, publicize that, to put up signs in the driftway, to put it on the website and to follow through. We don't actually test ourselves. It's uh, entirely up to the responsibility of the Division of Marine Fisheries. But uh, we then monitor the flats, make sure people have licenses when they go out there, uh, and limit the amount they take. Most of the time in the summer, the flats are closed, so we try to shoot people off. And that's a constant battle because you've got kids and families going across there uh, with their buckets and shovels, and we're just exploring. But in the process, they're you know, destroying their, their the resource that we do have there. Uh, and so that's. And our licenses flat, up, down? And, or would that not be something that. 
Well, we don't make money. Uh, <coughs> uh, last year we took in, let's see, $1,700. On about and a that $20 is for a resident, $50 for a non-resident. And it's good for one year from date of issue. Great. Any further discussion I'm from the board? I'm going to make a comment. I was out there with Paul Reedy this past weekend. Paul went out? Oh. Paul went out. And uh, they were in good shape. They were. Yep. The only thing I see is that you don't have your deputy. Yeah, th that's... Not by choice. Uh, <laughs> uh, I put in my recommendations, and unfortunately, those weren't the same as the time of mission. It would be nice to have two of us because we have both ends open. It's impossible for one person to cover two ends in time. Uh, and he only was getting like 120 hours a year. So that's the only change that I see in the budget. Further discussion from the board? On the floor? Joe, thank you. I might just say again uh, for those we're not voting the budgets tonight both the advisory board and the board of selectmen have opted to hear the budgets uh, in their entirety and then later down the road when we get a better handle on the finances available we'll, 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 we'll be voting the actual number so as of now we're not we're not voting to accept or not accept DPW <coughs> Waterways, Joe? Uh, should be water. How about waterways? Thank you. Gentlemen, if you'd introduce yourself again, John, how are you? Mark. Mark Patterson, Harbor Master. Um, before I start, if I could, I just want to take a, one second to clarify one of um, Mr. Murray's comments. He mentioned that Mr. Stress um, does a lot of patrolling in the North River in areas that we typically don't um, patrol. Mr. Strass's areas of responsibility include portions of Marshfield, Norwell, and Hanover. So when you refer to the areas that he patrols that right. we don't do get to, it's yeah. because they're not in situ. Right, right. Mark, would you be good to kind enough to read the mission statement? Dot us off and we'll... Sean. Very near the back. Well, oh, thanks. The mission of the Situate Harbor Master, in accordance with the Situate Waterways Management Plan, and situate mooring rules, regulations, and town bylaws is to ensure the safety of the boating public, preserve and promote order among vessels that habitually moor or transit situate waterways, maintain and enhance town-owned maritime facilities while protecting the integrity of the harbor as a natural resource and to defray the cost of providing these services through the assessment of user fees. Thank you. Uh, again, as, as with so many departments, it, uh, it goes without saying what a outstanding job everyone's doing and certainly uh, yourself included we have a habit that uh, people from out of town out of state just rave about about the courtesy and, and, and the accessibility of the your staff so I'll start it off by saying that thank you, very much. Thank you for all you do then open it up to the board I just want to also introduce uh, the chairman of the waterways uh, commission John Murphy here uh, as well I got nothing to add. These guys are doing great. Yeah. Tony? Sure. Mark, years ago, before we opened the new marina, which obviously has just been showcased and it's wonderful, um, we talked about the slips and the additional revenue we were going to get from those additional slips. Can you just give me an update on the status of that and where where we are in that program? Sure. Because we're going to go from 60-something to almost 100, was that, or 80s? What was the... Uh, well, first of all, the improvements uh, of the marine park and the facilities over there have been a multi-year, multi-phase project. We're now in uh, approximately the third or fourth phase. The most recent successfully completed phase, uh, phase was the dredging of the basin around the uh, marina and the uh, travel of piers. So with that dredging work completed, we're now in a position to expand the marina. Uh, we have a bigger footprint to operate. So we're looking at uh, this spring. Uh, in fact, we hope to release an RFP for procurement of the floats over the next week or two so that we'll have floats in place this spring uh, to capture some of that additional revenue. Th last year, we had um, about 50 patrons over at the Marine Park. We originally had hoped to, and I believe our Chapter 91 license permits us to have up to 100 slips. Um, 
we chose during the negotiations with the new boatyard operator to relinquish a portion of the marina to their control. Um, they're using that for staging, for boat hauling and launching. Um, so the actual number that we're looking at now in terms of um, slips is probably somewhere in the range of 80 to 88, which uh, actually is um, when we purchased the property, the existing 91 license actually permitted uh, 88 slips. So we're about where uh, they had hoped to be. We will be. We will be. Right. Good, because I remember the capital plan that you put before us got a little tight in, in these years coming up now, so that's obviously your challenge is to get those up and going as soon as possible to, exactly. to reap that revenue. Now, how are we looking? Your revenue projection for the year is 982. Yes. Is that right? And then the expenses are a little bit over a million. And is it the indirects that bring those into, into budget? It, it is the indirects. Um, last year, we, we've, we faced similar, a similar situation in the last couple of years, and we've gone to the special town meeting and appropriated um, some money from retained earnings in order to meet those projected revenues, um, those projected expenditures. Uh, we have not yet had to uh, dip into those retained earnings. So in the past two years since we started this project and this year, we did um, make a narrow profit. Yeah. Good. Great work. I mean, yeah. it is just wonderful down there. I'm sure, I know all of us have gone down there a number of times, but it, it is really a showcase for the town. So it came out I applaud all the work. And the, the people who did all the work, the, the, the volunteers, uh, the Waterways Commission, uh, the people in my office, all deserve an awful lot of credit for that. If, if, if people haven't been down to the Maritime Center, um, it's, it's winterized now, but it's going to be opened up in a couple of months, and I encourage you to go down there and visit it. I think you might, uh, before you go on, just to, as a point of information, and in in, in John, who has the Waterways uh, Enterprise, all of the money that runs the harbor, the, the, the Everything that's done down, there, <coughs> done down there comes out of the Water Enterprise Fund, which is paid for by the boaters. So, uh, all in all, non boaters or non people who don't use the harbor aren't paying for uh, anything down there. So, that's I think is a real plus. Uh, the people who, again, we you know, we try to get back to the if 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 you use it, you pay for it, and I think that the only people that that uh, paying for all the good things down at the harbor are the, the people who benefit from it most, and that's the boaters. That's exactly right. And we do owe a uh, debt of gratitude to um, several agencies who have helped us out, and right. particularly the Seaport Advisory Council, mm -hmm. who during the um, past couple of years have um, granted the town of Situate nearly a million dollars uh, in grants mm -hmm. toward the infrastructure improvements that we've seen down there in the last couple of years. Further discussion from the board? No. Good job. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank yes. you. Thank you, John. And now, DPW. Al? <coughs> Kevin? Let me just. Uh, Gentlemen, bring your chairs. Give us, one, give us one second, if you would, Al. <coughs> Thank you. Find ourselves here. Is anyone else cooking? Public works. Is it hot? I've just been so cold all day. I'm. I don't notice, so I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Is anybody else hot? Then it's warm. It's warm. I think we're going to start off, Al. Uh, well, I guess for that, with that, everything yeah. was. Thank you. Um, with me here tonight, I'm Al Banger from the Department of Public Works. Kevin Cafferty, the town engineer who you've known from your previously meeting him this evening, of course. Gene Babin, whom you've known for years as the manager of the Water Division. And Bob Rowland, who you've known for years as the manager of the Sewer Division. And not here with us this evening is Mike Breen, who is responsible for grounds, highway, and uh, snow plowing. Um, I'll talk about the mission of the Department of Public Works as you uh, have as your, your plan. Then I'll give you a, just a brief overview on the budgets, and then uh, I think we can discuss any individual budget in whatever detail you'd like to do it. Great. Okay? Thank you. Uh, the Department of Public Works exists uh, to provide services to the residents and the property owners of Situate. Uh, these services include maintaining and improving the roads, the parks, the cemeteries, and the playgrounds 
delivering fresh water for consumption and for fire protection, disposing of municipal solid waste in a responsible manager while, manner while encouraging recycling, uh, managing the collection and treatment of sanitary waste for those uh, situate residents who are connected to the municipal sewer system, also managing all infrastructure construction projects and these services must be provided in the most efficient manner and in accordance with all federal, state, and local statutes, regulations, and bylaws. That's our job. Um, we consist of uh, 49 able-bodied men and women uh, working in a number of facilities throughout town. Um, our budget uh, for the uh, proposed fiscal year 11 uh, is for $9.9 .9 million in total. Um, if you would, Kevin, maybe hand that out. This uh, $9.9 .9 .9 million budget is $600,000 higher than last year, and I thought I'd give you just a few bullet points of uh, where that increase in budget comes from. Uh, this $635,000 increase comes uh, uh, in the largest chunks would be uh, increased debt service in water, sewer, and transfer station. This is a result of investment in infrastructure. When you put new, new pipes in, you have to pay uh, for the borrowing on that. Uh, that increased the uh, budgets totally by 178000 There's an increase in intergovernmental charges uh, to the sewer, water, and transfer station that's based upon services provided by the town departments uh, to those facilities. That's a cost of $138,000. Uh, we've had an uh, increase in our water treatment chemical costs of $100,000. We've had an increase in the sewer electrical bills of $100,000, which we hope we will see it offset by a change we're making with the vendor of electricity, as well as then significantly improved in the future with this turbine project. But nonetheless, this budget carries a $100,000 increase in electricity cost from the current uh, year's budget. Um, additionally, uh, the Grounds Department, most particularly, and the Highway Department are charged are being charged now for water and sewer bills. Of course, that generates more revenue for water and sewer, so that's there's an offset there. And then there's a uh, we plan to uh, in the new fiscal year budget we've included fifteen thousand dollars for revising the mid seventies version of the situate sewer regulations, which have had a number of changes over time. Sewer reg regulations are ultimately approved by. Uh, this Board of Selectmen and then town meeting. So these, these need to be done in a very organized way. So we plan to revise those in the coming year. That's built into the sewer budget. And then also we built in $14,000 into the engineering budget for the seawall survey, which we would do starting in July. So those adds up, add up to the $600,000 increases. <clears throat> uh, the impact uh, of most of these increases are on the, uh, the sewer users, the water users, and the transfer station users. Um, the impact on the general fund totals around $50,000 of these budget changes. So that's kind of the overview of the whole department. Of course, the best way to look at it now as you review it will be questions in specific departments. And I brought the department managers here with me today, and I'll speak on behalf of Mike Breen. Very good, and thank you for that update. I, I just want to uh, point out that, that Gene Babin, who's been giving an excellent service here in the town for, for 10 years, is planning his retirement in early spring, Gene. Am I correct? March 1st, sir. March 1st, and thank you for all your service. If we don't have a chance to, to see you again and acknowledge you publicly, we'd like to do it tonight. Thank you, and, and best of luck in your retirement. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your recognition. Uh, so just one, the board. <coughs> just one quick. Yep. Al and I, you, you kind of said this, but just for people to understand, of the ten, almost $10 million budget that you mentioned, $7 million of it is enterprise funds, which, as Joe mentioned a minute ago, are self-funding entities. So Paid it, by users, yes. Are paid by users. are not paid by the budget for the town. Correct. So it really has, has no impact on that. And then also of the, and you just mentioned this, of the $600,000 delta, $500,000, Seventy-five thousand of that is also associated associated with those same enterprise funds. So yes. the impact on the actual budget that we're well, we vote on it all, but is impacting the operating budget of the town is minuscule in comparison to the numbers that you mentioned earlier to everybody. Yes. So your, your water rates may go up a little bit, or they won't, but they but they're they're incorporated in that water increase that we had mentioned. Yes. 
two or three years ago. And, 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 and going back to your point about the uh, impact on the enterprises, uh, those are results of investments to make improvements in those enterprises, in sewer investment and additional uh, sewer collection systems, uh, in water in investments in additional uh, uh, improving the piping situation for this uh, brown water situation and pressure situation we face, and in the transfer station in terms of uh, equipment that will keep the place running. Right. So when you read your, your goals or your mission statement, one of them was to provide the water to, fresh water to the town, and I know that's probably, it's up there in our top ten complaints for people with brown water, but this, this money that's going in there is replacing those pipes to correct that infrastructure so that that does not continue. So that's where you'd see that in, in the budget itself. It's still fresh brown water. Yes, fresh brown water. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's brown. <coughs> Rick Murray. And that is um, part of the water fees increasing, is that correct? Yes. So we're continuing on our path of 5% increases that the selectmen have committed to. That's correct. We, that's, we've, that's all built into this? Yes, we put in uh, the capital budget, which we were reviewing earlier today with the capital uh, planning committee, an additional $1.3 million for uh, water line work for the, for the coming year, yeah. uh, for the, the coming budget. And it, Yes. That's, that's great. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, you folks last year did a survey of our rates, how they compare to neighboring towns and similar sized towns, and we still are below the mean in terms of our average, which is why we feel we can afford this 5% increase to take care of this infrastructure. So I'm really pleased to see you continuing on with that. Um, two other completely unrelated things. Um, one thing I've been long concerned with is uh, new park maintenance. I know I've spoken to you about this. Um, we have all these pocket parts that the MBTA has turned over to us. We've got streetscape parks now. We have the new marine park uplands portion, not the dredging and all this sort of stuff. How are you folks poised financially to be handling the, the maintenance of these, you know, the O&M of these things that we're, I mean, people give us parks, people work on parks, CPC helps fund parks. They, they go a long way to helping maintain and increase the beauty of the town and the, and the use of the town. But still, at the end of the day, it falls on you guys with O&M on it. Uh, it's a challenge. It's just like when we build a sidewalk, we have to <clears throat> maintain yeah. the sidewalk. But in the area of parks, uh, we've been fortunate. Uh, the, the parks are designed in large part so that uh, uh, the, the town people, we're equipped to do the mowing. The maintenance of the uh, plantings are more, more tricky. And we're looking at some creative ways um, for park adoption. You know, the Beautification Commission takes on many of the islands. They're not equipped probably with volunteers to take on new parks, but we're looking at other alternatives, such as um, we're working with a, uh, a partner in the Greenbush area, uh, an individual and, and his employer, uh, who are considering uh, investing, uh, working cooperatively to maintain the plantings there. And it'll work uh, with their programs very effectively as well. It will work to maintain the park. Uh, the new park that's coming up, uh, the Greenbush Park, uh, the, sorry, the North Situate Park, we're looking there at working with them, um, a group of people there as well. So we're, we're trying to uh, design the thing so that it requires uh, the minimum maintenance by the town employees and enjoyable maintenance by people who like that sort of work and can volunteer for it. Okay. Okay, good, excellent, thanks. Um, and then my third and final question so far, again, changing subjects, is uh, last summer there was a lot of discussion about seaweed removal and the costs associated with it, and I know we had some energetic discussions amongst us about what to do with it, if anything, or how far to, 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 to handle that. And can you just bring us up to speed as to your latest thoughts for this coming summer, please? Uh, yes, we, there is a, there's a limited amount of money in the budget for seaweed removal uh, focused on uh, the public beach areas uh, where we the, the philosophy that's been adopted is that where we have uh, staffed where we have public beaches that are owned by the town uh, and staffed with uh, public employees who are lifeguards um, that uh, if we if a health a public health situation is created then uh, we either have a choice of either closing the beach or doing rockweed cleanup or seaweed cleanup Unfortunately, seaweed cleanup is, is quite damaging to the beach uh, because uh, it involves uh, equipment going out of the beach. So therefore, it's, it's, a, it's a really tough situation. If it's a public health issue and it's a choice of closing the beach or not, then ultimately it's going to be a decision made by the town administrator in concert with the health department and yourselves. Uh, 
uh, what we can do is we can do it when called upon. We won't initiate action. Okay. Thanks. Thank That's it, so Mr. Chair. Minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think. Thanks, so. Yeah. And before I go to the, to my left, <clears throat> I think it's something we have to think about. What Rick brought up and, and mentioned the when a town is given a park or a building is built or whatever, <laughs> and, and it seems like a a win-win. And it's all done and said in the you know, ground, the ribbon cutting ceremony. And um, after that, the town sometimes has a quite a large bill to, to, to maintain these gifts, if I could put it that way. And maybe we should think down the road, uh, and I'm not sure how this would work out, but when we get a CPC uh, uh, project or something like that, that we ask that money be put aside in some sort of a trust or uh, perpetual care trust to take care of these uh, gifts. It's just something I think we should give some thought to instead of just voting them and just saying it's wonderful and then forgetting about them and finding out it's costing us thousands and thousands of dollars to maintain them and keep them up. So just just a thought. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Two, two points. One was to Mr. Murray's, which was I wasn't sure if we were looking about trying to get some form of, uh, with the um, rockweed removal, <clears throat> some form of like a um, York rake or something to, to deal with it. I know you had mentioned about looking at it as a public health issue and then going out probably with heavy equipment like we did last year. But I don't know, has there been any discussion along that line? I don't mean to put you on the spot at this no, point. That's okay. We, we put in the budget for a um, what's called a mini loader. Uh, which is a, a, s a small, uh, think bobcat, but don't think the squatness of a bobcat. We're looking at a m machine that could go uh, into numerous places and do that sort of cleanup better than, than the bigger equipment that we have. And there would be a piece of equipment that we would own that would cost us less to go do uh, incidental spot cleanup. But when it's a massive ev event, it's uh, almost impossible to take care of uh, anything other than you know, when it's bad enough that it needs to be done, it's usually a massive event re requiring contractors going out. Um, we're not talking about just raking up and l making things look nice. Uh, that's we, we haven't focused on that at all. Okay. But we, did, we are looking at a piece of equipment that can help um, with some spot cleanup when a big issue occurs. The other uh, question was I, I was down in, in, on the uh, seawall down on uh, Lighthouse uh, Road, and I hadn't wasn't sure if, if anybody had a chance to go down. It looked as though... In light of the recent storm, uh, there's more damage to that same section. So I just only, again, I think we were talking about trying to get a, a cost estimate on trying to core through that um, seawall if, if at some point. But I, if you take a drive down, it, and I think it's there's more deterioration on it. I, just, I have gone out there, okay. um, and actually I brought uh, Carlos from Coastline Engineering out there to take a look at it um, with me and give me his evaluations. All right. um, his feeling was that the bottom was stable. There was no structural underneath. rotation on, okay. underneath, so the, that was stable. Um, the top was corroding on it, so technically you could pour a cap on it, but um, in the current state it was in, in, in his opinion, um, it, it wasn't going to be a, a catastrophic failure, but it would just keep, it will keep rotting down. <coughs> and that's me. still, Bush. we don't know what's going on <coughs> on the inside of that from from looking at the dimensions on how it's moved, it hasn't really moved, so you would, you'd be under the assumption it was stable. And then we did some further research. The original wall was like 1908, and then they did another section in the 20s, and then another section, they widened it and brought it up. So there's, there's a couple sections of wall there. Okay. Um, but, you know, we, one of the other things we did do is I've contacted the DCR and, um, I'm looking into possible Tiger grants that we maybe put a percentage in, a 25% in, and they'd match some. And if if we do get approved for some of that money or if we are eligible for it, um, that might go a long way also. Um, and that'd be something that we could look at. Good. Thank you, Kevin. John? Just there was one, one line item that uh, repair and maintenance dropped off, 5000 last year, and just nothing, or $300 this year. What could that Which be? Which one, Sean? It is... Um, Administrative, that one? Under purchase of services, second one down, just under office machine maintenance. In. I wasn't going to. In. Oh, from 09 to 0. 09 and 010, it was 0. And then this year? In, in the DPW budget? Yes. 400. 
Yep. Okay. Five twenty. And I just looked at Could you get Not that big. Which one are you talking about, Sean? Second one down, repair maintenance, prop, um, slash equipment. It's page one, and it's under scheduled personal services. Second and one down. The second one down under office it's machine actually maintenance. actually 09. Oh, you know, right, nine sorry. Was 5, all right. Sorry, forget it. So it was gone last year also. Yep. All right, you're right. Further comments from the from the board, just to follow up on, on, on the seaweed uh, issue. You know, Tony's brought it up in the past. He's absolutely correct. You know that this is a coastal community, and, and it's a um, <clears throat> town that prides itself for one of its great natural resources, I think, are the beaches. And I fully understand what you're saying about the damage to the beach. I understand the, the work that goes into cleaning the beach, but um, somewhere in between there, I think we have to you know, pay some attention and if at all possible, make it as attractive as we possibly can for the residents. Because it's such a big plus to the town and uh, so many people enjoy it. It would be a shame to, to, to lose that asset. That's, yeah, I agree. I, when John mentioned the rake, I was like, I'm all for yeah. doing it every Friday so that the beaches are beautiful on I, Saturdays. I know, I know that you're looking from a health and safety, and that's. The, but I, I think be, it's like going to a, a ski resort. You know, they, you got to pat down the trails to make sure the skiers are there. I, and I know there's money. I realize that. I think, but I think the town would be willing to invest in that aspect for, because of the cost, because of the benefit that gets out of and it. And sand and waterways kind of go together, don't they? I, I, I guess the uh, the question then. Uh, is is also to, to address is uh, which beach are we ref uh, what area of beach are we talking about be the publicly guarded beaches or yeah. Yeah. many of the beaches uh, that public. actually uh, the town doesn't own uh, for instance the entire beach in Minot uh, from basically the Great Rocks south are uh, mm -hmm. it's not our property uh, although we do have a, a lifeguard area there so we clean that but I mean it, there's, a, there's a lot of questions around um, maintenance of beaches to, and I think the town administrator has started looking uh, further at the whole concept of the beaches as an enterprise and enterprise yeah. fund the money spent there to uh, help manage the beaches better manage the cost of the beaches because mm -hmm. quite frankly we're the highway department and yep. uh, you know we, we'll do the best we can with equipment and people uh, and we'll spend money on it but uh, the, the broad public responsibility is uh, for the highways this is an area that uh, needs some further examination. I think the, the idea, if I may, I think the, the idea of an enterprise fund is certainly worth, worth exploring. And, and whether it's oh, yeah. financially feasible or not, I guess exploring it would tell us that. But I think it's an area that uh, in order to, to, to do what we would like to have done and what like you'd like to have done, and, uh, it's probably going to have to be some sort of an enterprise fund. I know that, for instance, in Cohasset, uh, Sandy Beach is, I don't think it's a private beach, but it's run uh, with a membership, uh, mm -hmm. on a membership basis. So membership is, people pay membership, and that beach is generally maintained Pretty to well. a T. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. It's a little different. We, we're we're kind of doing a halfway, halfway, yeah, halfway yep, on. Yep. And uh, the the concept of, of enterprise par parallel would be, the transfer station, people can choose to have street side pickup yep. if they'd like to pay for that, or they can choose to dispose of items and use the recycle center at the transfer station. They just pay a fee for that. And then we try to run the transfer station in a very, very responsible manner. And I think if we had an enterprise for looking at beaches and beach parking, it would undoubtedly be run in the same way. And we are, we are looking at that. Um, the rake machine costs $120,000. Um, we did quite a bit of research, actually, when we had the seaweed issue and mm -hmm. how sent um, th all their information. Sure. You know, a big portion of their town is state-owned, um, but we did get a lot of data from other communities on how much the rakes are. Yeah. Um, and that sort of backed into the whole discussion that Al's referring to about, you know, we can do more with our beaches, but. Mm -hmm. You know, our sticker is the lowest in the area yep. by double. But that money also goes to the general fund, doesn't it? So, you know, if we decided to create an enterprise fund, we'd be taking money yeah. from yeah. the right. budget to put yeah. it into an enterprise yeah. fund. And it's a, it's well, for yeah. perspective, the, uh, the total revenues from beach stickers is a little less than the total cost of the lifeguards. Right. 
and that doesn't pay to pave the parking lot, line strike the parking lot, pay for porta potties, clean the beaches, take away the garbage, Trash. or any other amenities that are looked for. So the rest of it is just, you know, so it's at the price of the beach sticker, it's, it doesn't cover any the of basics. That. Yeah. So you can split the baby, cost. Tony. You can still have a, some go into the general fund and create a specific enterprise fund for, you know, very specific Aspects. things. That, well, I think your, yeah. your greater point was that our our beach sticker is a bargain in this town. It's an incredible and bargain. That was discussed at the last rec meeting, too. Yeah. Anything else from the board? Well, another bargain is our water is a bargain. Yeah. Our water <laughs> rates are very good and, and responsibly managed by Gene over the years. And our sewer rates are a bargain uh, and responsibly managed by, by Bob over the years. So I'd like to recognize them. Thank you. And we, we also recognize Bob also. There's Thank you. Norman. Could we hear a little bit more specificity about the uh, increase in inter intergovernmental services? Yeah, we certainly could. Yes. Uh, intergovernmental services, the, what we discovered was that the, um, the transfer station, the sewer enterprise, and the water enterprise were not uh, paying for a cost of uh, the management that's devoted to them. Basically, uh, the, uh, the DPW director and the engineering services while servicing those departments weren't being paid for by those departments. So we, we took a time analysis of how much time was spent on each one of those areas and then those are the charges that are going to those departments. So it's, it's the management overhead of you, it's the management services that they're being provided. Thank you. No. And it, just for clarification, that's always been in effect. It's just they were revisited and Tricia went through them and, and tried yes. to make them more accurate. Right. And I think you mentioned that water and sewer are now being cross-charged as well. Yes, water is paying for its sewer bills and sewer is paying for its water bills. And transfer state. Now, I <coughs> saw one line a minute here where it's like $47,000, which is the water and sewer coming into one of these other budgets. Yeah. So. Um, but it's always been done. It's just been revisited. <coughs> Thank you. Now on to. Thank you, sirs. Thank you. Thank you. What's snow and ice? No. Don't go snow too far. Ice? Don't go too far. Snow, snow and ice. ice. Snow and ice. Oh. Okay. You're still. The seat's still hot for you. <laughs> And then street lights. I think I was trying to suggest. Did you want to a ask any questions about any of them? I, I think is that what you're. Oh, is, that, is that what you're looking to do, Al? Sorry. Sorry. Were you looking to basically? If we had any <coughs> questions on any of these departments, yes, we'll any, ask any questions. Right. Why don't we just continue on snow and ice? Of course, is the the most obvious one. Uh, is how has the new policy been working out halfway through the winter here? Um, we are, we are, we have spent currently 58% of our budget, uh, our $487,000 budget. We spent uh, $283,000 with uh, 204 remaining. Uh, on the first storm, uh, we had some wrinkles to work out with which, uh, with this plowing of streets. Uh, the second storm, and, and we were rewarded with feedback from many people on that, so we took that feedback into account and that helped us adjust uh, on the second storm. Um, frankly, uh, we we're pleased with the way it went in terms of uh, there was some differential plowing. In some areas got more plowing than others. Uh, this, the, uh, we were able to catch up with the sidewalks we wanted to do first so that we could get the kids to school. Uh, there were some issues around one of the schools in the first storm. We think we resolved that in the second storm. So um, it's working uh, satisfactorily. Now, one last question for me. Do you have or are you planning to put in place some way that streets that are now private ways could become public streets and therefore be granted all the privileges of plowing and everything else that goes with it? Is there yes. a procedure or? Yes, we are, we are we've uh, been studying what the procedure has been and what it should be who the members of the street acceptance committee are, what their role is, what the role of the selectmen in the town meeting is. 
Um, and we've identified uh, at least 10 large areas of, of streets, not 10 streets, but it, it might be 25 streets, but it's uh, several subdivisions with four or five streets in it, several individual streets that, for, that's, that you can identify why they didn't become public streets. Some of them might be that they were uh, developments that uh, didn't, uh, didn't get transferred over to public streets because of the uh, objectives at the time, mm -hmm. or they might be streets that for whatever reason, no one carried it through the process. So one of the things we're doing is uh, sending out our engineering team to begin looking at all of those streets to begin getting a handle on what needs to be done there and then going proactively to those residents and say, uh, we'd like to help you work your way through the street acceptance process. It may mean that, that some residents and some subdivisions have to invest in their street to bring it up to standards, but then they'll be rewarded, if you will, with a top-notch street, uh, and then it'll become, uh, through the public process, public's responsibility to maintain it from thereafter. So it is one of our objectives is to get as many private ways that are feasible into the public domain, given that that's what residents want. Because there are, there are some situations where, where uh, the audits of conditions set by the planning board back in 1962, when the street was uh, put in, was for example, I, I just recently heard of one where the, uh, one of the audits was uh, that the playground was to be built. And, and subsequently, the, the developer died, and so didn't the idea of a playground. And I guess nobody really even knows where the playground is supposed to be. Something like that, I think, should be looked at, and maybe we could ask the planning board to waive that, whatever the procedure yes. is, and they can become a, a, a public street right. without spending a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, things and like that is... The Street Acceptance Committee, as you know, Mr. Chairman, is um, made up of a member of the Planning Board, uh, the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, um, a member of, uh, of the Advisory Committee, and then a member of the Department of Public Works. And those four responsible people can b take that into account and then that to balance mm -hmm. and work that within the Planning Board and within the Selectmen and within the Engineering Department and move these uh, projects forward in a way that makes sense to everyone, I think. I don't think we've accepted, some, and somebody certainly would correct me, I don't think we've accepted a street in probably five or six years. I think we, at one time we were doing it every, every year would be, you know, two or three streets would be and I accepted, don't, don't but recall I, any. Yeah. and I remember certain ones in North Situate that every year it would it would be up on the, annual town meeting yeah. for whatever you know usually an easement or a problem would set it back so it would go back another year and it was one street in mind. I know Village Lane I think <clears throat> might have been the last one and it, it went it came up several times when I in yeah, doing the research did, and that was in like 05 or 06 so yeah. Yeah. and uh, so it's important that we've, we've now logged where private ways are and where public ways are uh, we're doing some identifiers so that people understand that as part of this is a is an a not public relations, but a just public awareness campaign so people know where they are. The town is shortchanged when we have private ways. Uh, the town is shortchanged on state monies. We don't get Chapter 90 money for private ways. And if we're maintaining those private ways, we're, we're getting a double whammy. We're paying the money to maintain them, and the state's not giving us any reimbursement for us. So moving s streets to the public domain is good. Again, unless the residents prefer to have a private way, a gated community might be, uh, or uh, whatever, um, it's it's better for the public, it's better for the residents, uh, and I think it's better for our budgets that we bring streets up to standards and into private ways. I think it's also better for the safety of the residents. I mean, there are private ways. You know, people get sick on private right. ways just as easily as they do on public ways, and yep. you know we want to avoid that situation where. Uh, something critical happens. Yes. Sean? We've all heard of many times people will buy a home and don't realize it's a private way. Until That's a lot of times until. that happens. A lot of times yeah. people don't Particularly know. Particularly the second, the second yeah, generation of homeowners are shocked. <clears throat> uh, right. right. And so if... In, yeah. But that's not, and again, with all due respect to those people, that's not the town's problem. They, they've got to do their due diligence. They realize it. And, and, and I think what you're trying to accomplish is, is a fair... A fair thing, you know. Uh, you know, it, it, 
for, unfortunately for those people who live on those private ways, there may be an investment that they have to do in order to get it to the town's level. But they've been reaping benefits for the past years, and, and now it's yeah. time that you know they're going to have to. Uh, and there's a process help for that, uh, too, Mr. Danahy, that if uh, if, uh, if uh, investment needs to be make, made in drainage, I know of a, a street in particular, it breaks my heart to uh, think about this street. These people are surprised to find out that, that they live on a private way. Um, it's, it's out near the town reservoir. Um, there's a drainage issue there. They, we've been working with them on the drainage issue and found out that, it, lo and behold, uh, there's, a, there's a number of problems that we can't work on the drainage issue because it's not our property. Right. And uh, so we're working with them on how to bring that up to speed. Uh, there'll be some investment on their part, but uh, through the betterment process, uh, uh, they will be the beneficiaries, and, and they can spread the cost of this over the neighborhood and over a number of years. And I, I think this will be, and then, then it becomes the public's responsibility to maintain it forever. But it wouldn't be fair for the public to take on a defective street and fix absolutely. it. Because the public's right. not responsible for that. Just, just one, one line, last okay. question. And I could see that happening 40, 50 years ago. But most recently, I think there's a development that we haven't accepted. So we are holding money. So we could finish those, make those improvements, correct? Yes, there's some, uh, yes, yes. Just a Tony? quick question. Al, you mentioned 58% of the budget. Is that through the storm today or this That's week? That's through the last order of salt we've just made to restock our salt supply. So we're we're, uh, that's that's everything up through to today. Right, and we've been fairly lucky because storms have been on weekends and Sundays and holidays so far, so we, we have yeah, a little bit of. Uh, but they, they've been kind of dragged out storms. That's one of the problems. The you know they, uh, it's not a storm. You go in, muscle it, and you're done. You know the, the both storms were like three day storms. So, right. and but, so they were big storms. Is my point. They, they were there were only two, but they were big, so that's good news. You know because we spent. Uh, half our money, uh, but it's uh, they were big storms. Now the bad news will be if we have a lot of big storms. Right. But um, on capital outlay, the capital plan and equipment, there's thirty-two thousand dollars in there. Is that for new equipment, or is that <coughs> just paying off? Um, in which budget? In uh, snow and ice. Snow and ice. No, Th those are um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Those are items that are less than twenty-five thousand. Okay. And, and generally more than 5,000. It would be plows and plow replacements, hydraulic system replacements, sander replacements, that sort of thing. Okay, so it's small equipment to yes. repair our own equipment. That's correct. And the other thing you mentioned, that Bobcat for the, I don't know what budget that's in, but is that on the capital plan? When you say it's in the budget, it's not in this budget, it's in the capital correct. plan. Correct, it's, it's on a capital plan. We're working through with capital planning and the town administrator to figure out in what way should it be funded. There's a, there are a couple of different possibilities there. Thanks. And that would have a snowblower on it, which would use. I was going to say, do you get a snowblower on it? Yeah, it has. Uh, we've, we've te uh, this was uh, Kevin's idea. It was a project uh, that they did in Lexington where they bought several of these machines, and they're on the state contract, and numerous communities have them, and they're kind of hard to get. Um, but we had one brought down, and uh, it, it'll go right down uh, through the sidewalk, even the sidewalks on Front Street, which are very difficult with all those overhanging things, uh, and can then blow it into the street, and then our equipment can pit, take, it, take it up. Uh, and, and that's something we're looking at. So the snowblower would help us. We have, um, we have more, uh, I don't want to say that, I don't know how many miles of sidewalk we have compared to other towns. Uh, but it takes us four days to do sidewalks when we're flat out. And so, you know, you, we do work on schools first. It's just tough to get them all done. So a second machine would give us the ability to do our the sidewalks we must do um, Quite more effectively. So if you can just tell the people that are watching, your priority list for sidewalks are, are sidewalks to schools and then business. What? Sidewalks to schools, sidewalks to uh, uh, centers, such as the sidewalks to the... Uh, um, North Situate Center or to the Greenbush Center um, or to the village, uh, Harbor Center. Uh, and then when we're all done and things are put to bed, then we, uh, we, we go in and we big try to clean out, do the, do the, a more extensive clean out on things like the Harbor or the North Situate. But we do that on, uh, we're, we're focusing on trying to do that on straight time. Now it may mean that what we do is we close Front Street. If we can close Front, front Street for Heritage Days for a weekend, we can close Front Street from 6.30 until 10.30 some Tuesday morning. Uh, 
block it off and do the cleaning and then get out of there. And that's what we're focused on, rather than doing it in the middle of the night with contractors. Thanks. Uh, anything else? Just the last thing I was going to say, the bike path on dr the uh, driftway looks like it's coming to uh, completion. It looks like you're moving telephone poles, which I assume was a part of the project. If it wasn't, it was smart. <laughs> Wouldn't want to walk down the path and have a pole right there. It looks good. So they're, uh, they're in the process of moving them. They got yeah. the pole set, but we're gonna have to wait for you know the electric oh. company cable right. and telephone to move them over. So we're hoping to have it complete by spring. Good. Looks thank, good. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> before we get up, uh, also was the Ann. <coughs> There are sidewalks that are not um, in front of stores <clears throat> and, and need to be cleared, and that's a, that's a public responsibility, and that's what we're looking to figure out how to go do effectively. We're getting the bugs out of it. It's a work in progress, I think, and yeah. hopefully it'll... I mean, it's it's the same people doing what they used to do. It's you were just trying to get the focus. We've got some certain areas we have to do uh, um, more effectively. We have to, do, we have to make sure this... If we're going to open the schools, we have to make sure that students can get to the schools and parents can drop off children. and. Uh, people can get to, to the commuter rail station is important and it's second, but we will we're going to make take care of it. And we're trying to get the bugs out, and there's only one machine and one person that knows how to run it. So that's why we're looking to. Um, Thank you. Move that up. Thank the you. idea of the second machine primarily is if we have a breakdown with one of the machines, we're in, we're in a lot of trouble doing the sidewalks. Thank you. From the board, anything else? If we can move on to. Uh, Three lights and beacons. This is we just uh, received uh, a love letter from National Grid saying that they're uh, increasing the electric rates on street lights by 7%. We didn't build that into our budget, um, so we're going to have to regroup a bit. Uh, this, this budget in here, I think we increased it by $5,000. How much? Level I got to find it here. Level 193. <coughs> Close. 188 last year right? yeah um, so that didn't take into account the increase in price of electricity uh, we are the town administrator has um, identified a contractor we can use who will on a um, contingency basis if you will audit our street lights uh, we suspect <clears throat> that we have a number of street lights that are in existence but not turned on but we're paying for them uh, because they're either they're not functioning or they weren't taken off the records but this person has the ability to go through uh, the records of national grid find out what we're being billed for on a pole by pole basis are they there are they the right size and then also make recommendations about changing from mercury vapor to sodium whatever it's called <laughs> Uh, and and uh, also help us with understanding about uh, maybe we've got too big a bulb or too small a bulb in certain areas. So uh, we will reap some benefit from that. So uh, we're not in the midst of uh, a light turn off program. That may be, the, but we will probably find some lights w that are superfluous and others that are missing. Okay. We have uh, three more water, in, uh, water enterprise, sewer enterprise. And transfer the prize. We did those. Huh? So, but we kind of went through them uh, earlier. So, uh, unless, unless you have specific unless questions, there are further so. questions. I don't. I think we're pretty well answered. Okay. They're all at a break even or. A yes. Um, sewer um, is. I don't want to scare anybody, but sewer rates are getting closer and closer to closing the gap uh, of income versus spending so we're going to be looking at the balance of that we're okay going into the next year 
but sewer rates uh, uh, may not be flat forever. Um, but we'll be very cautious in, in our analysis and, and plenty of notice, but I don't expect anything in the coming year. Thank you. Okay. But, uh, before you leave, Kevin, I just, I'd like to start the seawall committee. I'd like to, maybe I could work with you and we could notify Jim Bailey, uh, who will be maybe acting chairman or something until they come in and they organize. Uh, I can talk to Kim, get the resident, and get everybody who's on Yeah, there maybe right send him a letter. We'll set up a meeting sometime and yeah. go from there. That'd be great. Thank you. Al, just quickly, the transfer station, same way, the increase that we did in the bags and stuff has, has sustained the enterprise. Yep. We're seeing a delightful increase in revenue that's covering the expenses. Uh, we're being cautious on any kind of purchases that, uh, or any debt increases that might op offset the balance until we kind of know what, how the, the thing shakes out. Uh, it's, it seems to be rocking and rolling. We've got um, had some personnel issues there. I think we're getting those resolved. Not issues, let me don't say that. I mean, we've had some illness and we've had a, a, a two illnesses, really. So we're kind of struggling. But uh, that's added some cost. But I think we've got that ironed out. Kevin's worked that out for us. And um, we have some interesting things coming for the take it or leave it. More news at 11. <laughs> Thank you. Bill Fender. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, guys. Oh, Norman, I'm sorry. You're right. Before you leave, Al or Kevin. The question is, can you squash this on sewer projects, adding all of the new houses? Do I see that? We would hope that it would reduce sewer rates overall. Yes. Maintaining long term. Or maintain that'll may prolong the uh, flatness of them. Yes, yes, and the pending approval of uh, permitting. Uh, it looks like we could actually no, hold on to your socks, but we could be uh, the gold standard. Would be we could begin constructing this summer. Still pending approval, but pending DEP approval. But we're feeling pretty good about that. That's great, that's great. Thank you. Uh, voting annual license renewals, number nine. Uh, you want a motion? Please. Uh, <coughs> move the board selectmen vote to grant the renewal of the common victuals license for BAP G Corporation doing business as Dad's Place Variety Store for 2010. Second. second. And a second. Further discussion from the board? From the floor, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Appointments? We met uh, Eric earlier this, this evening. I'd entertain a motion. Sure. Move that the Board of Selectmen appoint Eric Richmond as a, an associate member of the Recreation Commission. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you, Eric, for volunteering. Uh, the next is a gift from the Recreation Department. We, we read this letter last week. John read the letter from the Phillips Foundation. Uh, uh, it was a $5,000 grant to the Recreation Department to fund uh, children with special needs and their participation in the Recreation Department's <clears throat> program. So we read the letter last week, so I'll take a motion. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to accept a gift of $5,000 from the Edwin Phillips Foundation to fund scholarships for children with special needs participating in the Recreational Department's All-Star programs. The town accepts this gift on the behalf of the Recreation Department. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. We thank the Phillips Foundation. Uh, Tricia. Um, on the report, just three quick items. One, um, thank you for attending the ethics seminar we had last uh, January 5th. We had over 45 folks attend. Um, some were there for two and a half hours. I think um, some folks learned some stuff that the board will be taking action on over time as far as special municipal employee status. Um, the PowerPoint presentation is up on the employee internet site, um, so people have a constant reference for it. But overall, we're very pleased with 
the turnout and the information provided. You have the period ending December 31st, 2009 for the financial trend monitoring on revenues and expenditures. December 31st marks our midpoint of the fiscal year. No new surprises. Uh, fire overtime, I'm still watching and, and close contact with the chief. Transfer station, as <coughs> Al mentioned, looks like it's turned the corner for the period ending December 31st. Snow and ice, Al already talked to you about. We seem to be um, feeling manageable. I know some communities have already expended their snow plow budget. And um, we received our large motor vehicle excise tape uh, two weeks ago. It's $45,000 more than uh, last year, uh, so we'll take it. Um, not enough to revise our local receipts, but I'm sure the governor will do that for us next week when he submits his budget. I'm happy to answer any questions on, on that. Mm. Any questions for the town administrator? Well, yeah. the only thing, uh, I'm an attrition. Jane briefly the other day, and there was a paper in the Globe that said all the, <clears throat> a lot of towns in, in the state are having trouble collecting their tax money. Yeah. And that's where Jane and Trisha were very pleased to find out that in situ it we've, that she's doing a great job in, in getting that money in. So yeah. it's uh, in our, our form of uh, accounting, it's not how much you do, it's how much you actually get. Yep. So if people don't pay their taxes, then we can't provide the services. So it's good to know that we're not in this upside down um, scenario where we're not collecting our money to provide services. Is that correct? The other piece of this is um, since this report's only showing you a very small snapshot of some particular accounts the board's been concerned about, the rest of the department expenditures have been monitored. So by tomorrow, every department head has to report and itemize for me if their budget's over 50, 60% expended as of January 1. Traditionally, I think there's been some lack of formality, for lack of a better word, when people run short at the end of the year and think it will be made up. Folks have been very clear since the summer that it's not the process anymore. So with the intent that, you know, if you know you want to run short, you have six twelfths of the fiscal year to make up the difference and make other adjustments instead of June 1st comes and it's, oops, I, I need a reserve fund or an interdepartmental transfer. So I think it will be interesting um, to see that. And as I said, I have them for most departments, but I haven't looked at them because they're not due till tomorrow. Last one is what we talked about earlier is the beach sticker. We have a committee that's meeting. Um, a lot of good ideas and issues were brought to the table with rec representatives from Recreation, DPW, um, Treasurer Collector's Office, and um, Police Department. So we hope we're meeting again uh, January 20th, which is tomorrow. Darn, I'm not ready. I had homework. Um, and uh, hope to have a report to the board, board um, early, early in February. Uh, Chief Stewart provided information for every beach uh, on the coast that has a beach sticker program. And wow. there's a tremendous amount of variety. And so we've been mulling that over as well as um, I asked Jennifer Vitelli to put together a wish list of, you know, trying to get a benchmark of, you know, we have these wonderful beaches. How could they be even more wonderful in terms of how we provide uh, amenities on them in terms of bathhouses or restrooms or things like that? So she's just put together that wish list. Because if we look at all in on the expenditures and the revenues for the beach stickers, if people are paying an increased fee or a fee, we should be plowing that back into improvements. Mm -hmm. And so what are those kinds of improvements <coughs> we don't have now that we could get? And the other piece of this, as you know, is the lifeguard budget I recommended reducing by 10%. So that will have impacts if, if that goes forward through town meeting. So, um, but I'm sure we'll have the committee in when we're ready to give you a report, hopefully in February. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, the next is a report from Jeff Rosen, Water Resources Committee. Jeff, welcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Committee, uh, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, that I can set up, but I also have uh, slides for uh, each of the, the uh, selectmen, so uh, as, as you wish. Well, why don't we look at the presentation. Very good. What do you think would be the most beneficial? Thanks, Jeff. 
I mean, we can follow it along. Can well, the I audience? Think, I think we'll be okay without the okay. PowerPoint presentation. But if, uh, if we Thank find you, that we're, we're getting lost or there's a need for uh, some better visuals, I'll be happy to uh, put that up on the wall. Great. Would, uh, Jeff, there are, we'll be going to executive session uh, shortly after this. And there may be some issues that come up in this presentation that would be better dealt with in executive session. Uh, Jeff, so I might jump in. If you get too far afield. I might jump in and say, hold it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, first of all, I, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lise Klein, who's a member of the Water Resources Committee. Uh, by the way, uh, for the record, uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, I am the uh, chair of the Water Resources Committee. I live at uh, 54 Old Oak and Bucket Road. Lisa, would you like to come up? Just please. Okay. And I uh, also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my, my, uh, our committee's uh, partnership with uh, Gene Babin. Uh, it has been very, very productive. Uh, it's been a cooperative uh, effort. The uh, material that I'll be reporting to you this evening, we, we've had these discussions over the last few years uh, repeatedly. But the material that I'll be uh, presenting to you this evening is a culmination of about three years of work. And we have a number of very important issues uh, before the town uh, related to the uh, supplying of, of uh, uh, drinking water, but also to the management of the town's water resources. It's important for everyone in the town uh, to, to uh, realize that the Water Resource Committee uh, has got responsibilities. We basically report back to the selectmen. We support many of the other uh, boards and uh, commissions in town. Uh, but our responsibilities are not only for drinking water. Uh, Gene regularly reminds us that uh, that's a part of our responsibility. We also have a responsibility for the actual other water resources in town that may not be relevant uh, to drinking water. So uh, we'll be addressing both of those issues this evening. Um, key items that, uh, that I'd like to uh, discuss with you this evening are the Herring Restoration uh, Project. Uh, new water resources and the withdrawal permit uh, renewal, which is uh, coming uh, towards us very rapidly now and will be uh, due uh, August of uh, 2010. Um, uh, many of you may recall the Herring Restoration uh, Project was initiated because of our last uh, permit withdrawal, uh, withdrawal permit, uh, which we received approximately three years ago. In that uh, withdrawal permit, there was actually a requirement put in from the Department uh, of Environmental Protection uh, uh, encouraging the town to uh, look at ways that we might restore the herring runs, which historically have been uh, 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 it, uh, part of the town of Situate and, and our culture. Uh, hence, uh, the, our main water resource is called the uh, First Herring Brook um, Watershed. And uh, we, we um, so we, we embarked on a project to look into what it would take to uh, restore the herring runs. The project's been ongoing for approximately uh, three years. I think it's very important to understand uh, Elise uh, uh, spearheaded this project for us. Um, Gene and I have both been very much involved in it. Uh, the, the participants in a work committee that we put together uh, under Elise's leadership included the Massachusetts DEP, the Massachusetts Riverways Program, which is part of Mass Fish and Game, uh, the U.S., uh, the federal government, Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Town of Situate, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, uh, the First Herringbrook Watershed Association, and Nature, Nature Conservancy. We've had uh, well over um, six meetings. Uh, Mr. Norton has uh, attended at least uh, two of those. Uh, Mr. Murray has attended a number of them as well. Uh, I think that uh, the selectmen who have been at these committee meetings will uh, attest to the fact that we had just an exceptional group of individuals with uh, far-reaching expertise. Um, in, your, in the handouts that you have, uh, there is a uh, map of the, um, of the Situate water supply. Uh, it includes the major tributaries that currently feed into our surface water supplies. Uh, you can't see it too well. If we put the slides up, you would see, but it also includes many of the wells. Uh, the majority of our water resources are, uh, uh, are situated in the uh, center of the town. Um, they all feed in one way or another into, uh, uh, um, into the reservoir along 3A, uh, into first, I'm sorry, into uh, Tack Factory Pond, which is to the west of 3A, and then into Old Oak and Bucket Pond, which is where our water is actually extracted. Um, we, we use approximately 60% six, of the potable water delivered in town is actually groundwater. 
So very few people understand that. Uh, the surface water supply is approximately 40%. Uh, when times get tough, we rely uh, more extensively on our groundwater supplies. Uh, so one of the questions that we had uh, was, um, with the water uh, resources that we currently have, could we restore herring runs to the watershed? Uh, again, historically, there have been uh, herring runs. I believe the last uh, herring runs that were observed or last herring that were observed in town were back in the 80s. Uh, we haven't seen uh, herring uh, in the waterways since then. So uh, in order for that to, uh, to occur, the, uh, the, the herring would have to run up, uh, the, uh, up North River. Uh, into Herring uh, uh, Brook, I guess, or it's Herring Creek, uh, the saline part of it, is that right, Gene, the term? And uh, then up the uh, fish ladder, which is at the uh, base of, the, of, um, of Old Oak and Bucket Pond. Uh, there is a fish ladder there. Our understanding is the fish ladder has not actually seen any activity for a long time. Uh, just so that you understand the biology very briefly, the herring run up in the springtime. They spend uh, much of the summer in these uh, freshwater ponds where they uh, live, they grow, they spawn, the, uh, the, spawn, the, the, the uh, young grow, and they then need an opportunity to get back out uh, of the pond in the, in the fall. As many of you know, we have plenty of water in town during the springtime so, the, so we can get the fish in. However, in the fall, there is not enough water, and uh, Gene, because of the management and the first priority of the water, being delivered for drinking water uh, is not able to spill water over that fish ladder. So we, we would not be able to get fish back out of the pond in the fall. Um, as far as we know, uh, the fish ladders have not been functional for many years. We don't know if that's because the fish have not been there and they therefore don't return or because the fish ladders don't function. But uh, hold on to that thought because as we go through the story, uh, we, we will give you better interpretation of the role and the challenges of the fish ladders. Um, so with that, uh, we, we initiated a study uh, with this working group that I uh, described to you earlier. Uh, and through the, uh, through the efforts of the, uh, the North and South uh, Rivers Watershed Association, uh, we were able to get support from the Nature Conservancy to actually do a study of the water budgets in the town of Situate. Questions that were asked were, how much water do we have? How effectively do we manage that water? And could we uh, offer sufficient water such that we could get the herrings in and out of our watershed, thereby restoring the herring runs? They also asked the question, why have the herring runs uh, stopped? Um, in part, that has to do with uh, biology. It has to do with chemistry. Our watershed has become somewhat acidic. Uh, we have issues with dissolved oxygen, and we also have uh, uh, issues with water temperature during the summer. Um, so the Nature Conservancy stepped in, and they have supplied us with a model called the WEAP model. Um, and the WEAP model was applied to study the ability of uh, uh, of, of the town of Situate to manage its water resources such that we could help bring the fish into the ponds and then also get them back out. Um, multiple scenarios were studied. The model was applied to basically say, okay, this is how much water we have. How might we manage it better to, uh, to maintain the environmental flows so the fish could get in and back out? And also, how could we manage the water resources better to improve the habitat so if we were able to get the fish in, uh, they would be able to survive in the uh, environment that we would present them. Um, so the, the, um, some of the options that were uh, studied were using the exif existing infrastructure, in other words, the ponds and reservoirs the way they are right now, the wells with the volumes of water <coughs> that they're currently producing, uh, and with the current dams and the current fish ladders. Um, Mr. Norton probably remembers from our walk out uh, to, to the reservoir that there is an impressive dam that very few people in town have probably seen uh, at the base of the reservoir, but it also has a very, very long fish ladder, and that fish ladder does not function. Um, so Can I just interject there? Sure. Had it yeah. functioned back in the 80s when this fish ladder, was this fish ladder there at that point in time? Um, the, the, the experts tell us that it's likely the fish ladder at the base of Old Oak and Bucket Pond functioned back in the 80s, but they do not believe that the fish ladder uh, has ever functioned effectively uh, at the reservoir. The okay. reason is that it's so steep and it's so long that they, they doubt whether fish would be able to make it up and down that, that ladder. Jeff, can I interrupt? Certainly. Just yeah. for one quick second. Sure. And I'm a, all I'm you guys want. You can ask all the questions. Please novice at this. But 
I understand wanting the fish to get in and out of this, uh, you know, environment. But is that how is that helping our water supply? Um, well, the, the answer is that uh, the, the, our water supply, the way the system has been set up for many years, had f uh, herring run. The herring help clean the, they help keep the uh, resources clean. They help reduce the organic material, uh, thereby reducing the fouling. They help uh, keep the water flowing properly. And it's also, again, since our responsibility is not only for drinking water, but it's also for the quality of habitat and the thrill of the herring running in and out and, and also, again, the restoration of a natural uh, uh, ecosystem. That so was, it's for cleaning the water supply and um, just, you know, the improving the, the, right. the trout. And, and just interject something. The state is also looking at restoring natural waterways. And if you take a look at the big picture, and I don't know if any of you are fishermen, but it brings in the bigger fish, the alewife. Bring, bring in bigger fish. So if you're a sportsman, I mean, you have your, you, the bigger picture is not just the Tama situate, it's the whole coast, it's whale watching, it's go out to, uh, go out to the banks. All right. We also will discuss further in the presentation that the likelihood is, many of you may recall from early in the, uh, in the fall this year, there's been a lot of political pressure on the state of Massachusetts to, uh, to improve the water habitat uh, to the point that there are organizations which backed away from cooperation with the state because that was not ongoing. So we're starting to see a lot of pressure, and, and I'll foreshadow a little bit that when we talk about the withdrawal permit, we can begin anticipating right now that there will be requirements from DEP. It's not going to be that they're going to suggest to us, but they, they're going to give us requirements for base flow for improvement of, of uh, our watershed and the ecology of the watershed, that somehow we're going to have to find ways to, um, to, to meet their requirements. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So uh, two quick way. things, two sure. quick things to follow up. Administratively, <coughs> it's a requirement of the permit. So there's that as well. Um, and then a little bit of ecology is it's kind of an indicator species as well. In addition to the fish themselves and, and what they eat and all that sort of stuff, um, when you have an ecosystem that can handle the fish, then a lot of other stuff is going on as well. If the fish can survive there, then there's a lot of other things that are going on that are improving the quality too, in addition to the fish themselves. Right. Sure. Wasn't this part of our MBTA agreement? Didn't they restore it in North Situate? And I don't know if you've even looked at that, but at Hunter's Pond, was yeah, it? Yeah, we did. Like was five it? or six years ago, there was, it was a CPC money that fixed the run yeah, in, CPC, yeah. in was it? Uh, North Situate. Yeah, but I'm not sure if that is, is running at this point. Actually, Bob Murray, who's on our committee, was a part of that. I think that they had minimal success with, uh, yeah. with, with that actually um, taking hold and, and being uh, persistent. And that's not part of our water supply either. That is not part of our water supply. So, um, uh, so again, uh, some of the other scenarios that were explored, as I said, in anticipation of, of uh, our new withdrawal permit, uh, exploration in the model was how would we restore base environmental flows. What this basically means is that every every day of the year there is at least a minimal amount of water flowing through our systems. We're no point are we stopping all the water flow due to a dam basically drying out any creeks. Um, other scenarios that were explored were upgrade of the infrastructure that includes the fish ladders as well as uh, dredging the existing reservoirs. That's been a, a solution that's been recommended repeatedly. Uh, perhaps all we need to do is get in there and dredge out our current uh, reservoir and our current uh, um, old oak and bucket pond where we're extracting the water, and that would solve all the problems. Um, again, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in a few moments. And then uh, finally, uh, they explored the, the, the possibility of new water sources or storage. Um, because uh, one of the things that we, w the situation we have in Situate is we have plenty of water. If we were to integrate the water over an entire year, we would find there's plenty of water. The problem is that uh, during the, uh, the winter uh, and sometimes in the fall, we have so much water that we're spilling millions of gallons of water a day over the spillway, and that's going out into the uh, North, North River and then eventually out into the ocean. But then when we need the water in, uh, in August, September, October, we, there was no way for us to take that water that we spilled and store it in any way and then bring it back uh, to, to do what we need for it to do in the, uh, in, the, in the summer and the fall. 
So, um, we, so it's not only a question of new water sources, but the possibility of new ways of storing the water such that when we need it, we could pull it out of our magic bag of tricks and make it uh, available to the habitat and to the, uh, to the herring to get back out into the ocean. Um, general conclusions that were reached by this study um, were that uh, at, a, the, the, at a minimum, restoration of the herring runs will require updates of the fish ladder and dams. Um, and the reason it's both the fish ladders is because the fish ladders get the fish in, but the dams need spillways and uh, other methods to get the fish back out. And then uh, we have to find more water during the critical months of August uh, through October. Uh, options for more water in the critical months, uh, again, dredging existing uh, uh, storage does not improve the situation. The reason being that as we dig the holes deeper, we don't have the structures to move the water into the plant or down the uh, down the, the stream to let the herring run out. So in other words, if we were to dig it lower, it doesn't really solve any problems. As a matter of fact, the modeling indicated that digging it uh, right. deeper actually took water away from our budget. It was not a helpful solution. It was a further problem. Um, the uh, additional needs could be accomplished, however, uh, with improved conservation, which is something that I think uh, the Water Resource Committee will be coming back to, to the selectmen over the next few months with some recommendations about how we might conserve better. Right now, the town situate is, uh, is, is at or below the recommended usage uh, that the state um, gives to the towns as far as guidance. Uh, but we believe that we could do even better, especially during the summer months, again, when we have problems. We believe that there's opportunities for much better conservation. Um, we are going, to, we're looking into increased uh, ways of storing water. And I'll give you some of those uh, ways in a, a few moments. Uh, new water sources, as you know, we're investigating new water sources. And then also creative management of existing water resources. Could be that we don't need to spill enough water for the fish to get out all, all during the fall, but rather perhaps we can pulse it. Perhaps every 15 days for three days we could put enough water over the spillway or through the dam so that the fish that are congregating can make their way back out to the water. And that way we would not have the constant spilling of water and rather than us needing another 50 million gallons uh, a year, perhaps we only need another 10 or 15 million gallons, in which case the storage now becomes something that is, uh, is at least conceptually possible. It's, a, it's something that we can begin exploring and finding solutions to. So um, again, part of the herring restoration project was this uh, wheat model. We now have the wheat model that has been turned over to us, the town now has a copy of the wheat model, and we are uh, uh, able to use that to study additional um, uh, additional scenarios. Um, we uh, somehow this slide got out of order. I apologize, but uh, I went over this material in this sl this slide um, again. That we we have got uh, strategies that could that could work. Um, the next steps that are suggested that we actually come back to the selectmen and, and soon it will be time for us to begin exploring ways to make this happen is that regardless of what else is done, um, fish ladders will need to be, uh, um, will, will need to include a framework for managing and ma uh, maintaining those fish ladders and anything that we do is going to require replacement of the fish ladders. So we need to begin looking for sources to A, evaluate the ones that we have, come up with new designs. We have uh, support from the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, are willing to help us do the design work at a minimum cost as far as the engineering. And then they also would help facilitate us finding uh, and actually purchasing the equipment that we need to uh, restore the, the, herring run, the, herring, the fish ladders. Um, the, the committee suggested that we do fertile, further modeling to close the gap on how much additional water we currently need. Again, if we look at a gross number, we need approximately an additional 50 million gallons a year, and that those 50 million gallons are, would be necessary during those critical months. Uh, but again, we might be able to lower those numbers through creative management of the water resources. Um, we need to start looking at expand, uh, expanded water conservation programs. Some of the things that were mentioned were things like mandatory um, uh, um, moisture uh, detectors for the soil so that people who have sprinkler systems are not watering when it rains or when the ground is already wet. A tremendous amount of water could be saved through programs like that. Um, and the committee also recommended that we, looked at, we look at a tiered implementation of the herring restoration. 
that we not try to bite the whole project off at once, but rather we look first at whether we can get fish back into Old Oak and Bucket Pond, rather than worrying. The, the most expensive portion of the project is likely to be at the reservoir where we have that really steep uh, fish ladder. Uh, that's going to be quite expensive to replace. But uh, the, the, the feeling is that we could begin uh, with a project to restore the herring runs into Old Oak and Bucket Pond, perhaps restore the habitat there, see how successful that is. If it's ex successful, then we could go seek uh, additional funds to uh, restore the herring runs right up into the uh, reservoir. And the, the permitting agencies, if I may interject, were, were very, who were all in the room during these conversations. Um, they were non-committal, as they had to be, but they were very supportive of the idea of this tiered implementation, and they fully acknowledged the fact that a small municipality such as ours is not going to be able to bite this big nut and do it all inside of three months. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the beauty of having all the people in the room from the get-go. So Gene's able to talk to them, Jeff's able to talk to them, everybody is there at the same time. <coughs> and if I could just add one other point, um, Jeff mentioned how um, some of the agencies are going to be funding some of this. They all had very, very positive words to say about these, these situate efforts, and I just want everybody to realize this, that they are, we are at the cutting edge of coastal municipalities and let alone probably other municipalities in this great commonwealth of ours right up front. I mean, they are falling all over themselves saying this is great because this is, this is top flight work that these, that these folks are doing. And that's why they're so supportive of this tiered approach. They're, not holding, they're holding us to the fire to make progress. They're not holding us to the fire to solve the problem in a month. Right. To, to add to that uh, particular point, <clears throat> um, uh, I, I think that they're looking at the town of Situate as a model for how uh, the whole state all of the municipalities can begin studying the restoration of, uh, of habitat because, again, there is going to be a move towards requiring that statewide, and our town will be an, an example of how that should be done. By the way, the wheat modeling that was done for us for the, by the Nature Conservancy uh, was done on a, uh, a federal EPA grant. Uh, so we are one of three case studies that are going to be viewed nationally about how one can evaluate water resources in the town and improve the management of, of those resources. So the, the town is in very, very good standing now uh, with, with all the agencies that, uh, that regulate us. Um, the recommendation was that we uh, consider moving towards minimal environmental releases, as I said, that our uh, waterways never get dry again. Uh, again, it's a very strong possibility that in the next few years that will be required by the state. It will no longer be an option. Um, we will be looking for uh, uh, increased raw water uh, storage. In other words, if we can take the water during the winter and pump it someplace where it can be maintained, uh, we will be looking towards doing that. Uh, there, are some, there, are, there are some options uh, that would include the possibility of using existing wells that we have and pumping the water back into the ground during the winter so it's stored underground uh, and then removing that water in the summer when we need it, pumping it back out blending it in in our reservoir and then making it available for, for habitat as well as to support the drinking water programs. Um, so that's just one option. I'm not saying that's the only one, but, but again, at some point we're going we're gonna to have to have discussions about how we continue our, our water pursuit because as Gene told you guys the last time we met, uh, we, we're not in a crisis situation now. However, over the next uh, <coughs> 10 years, we are going to need additional water resources, and it may come sooner than we think because of changes in uh, public attitudes about uh, environmental matters. Um, we are also looking uh, for improved technology. That would include things like better flow meters, uh, better control systems for the water plant so that we better can manage the resources that we currently have and understand how we're currently using them. Right now, many of our measurements are very, very rough. Um, we believe that there are resources in town, including uh, some water resources that are in place right now that could be better managed. Uh, one example that uh, Gene pointed to during the meeting is well number 17A, which is up uh, off of Tack Factory Pond, uh, off of Old Oak and Bucket Road, uh, which is a source <laughs> of about 1.5 uh, million gallons per day, 150,000 gallons per day. Um, that could be that could be further used uh, if we were to enhance that that well and manage it more effectively. Um, we the town is going to need to continue pursuing new sources and storage, and uh, the the uh, committee also recommended that as a community, we open up a public forum now to discuss all the work that we have done in the water. Uh, everyone felt uh, all the agencies involved felt that the the uh, efforts that Situate has undertaken should be. The, rest, the, the whole community should know about it, 
and should then be involved in finding uh, and supporting solutions. Um, as far as the new uh, water resources, uh, one way or another, we're going to need to find additional water resources. Maybe we, uh, maybe I could jump in here. Sure, maybe if please. we could if we could hold this segment uh, till executive session, just we can. I'm Absolutely. just a little concerned with no problem mentioning of property and stuff like that. So okay. if, you, if you won't mind, thank you. I don't mind. Uh, and and the the other uh, topic uh, uh, again that is very important for us all to be cognizant of is the fact that we've got. Uh, renewed water withdrawal permit that will be d due uh, th this summer, again, August uh, 2010. Um, there are data that are required from the state that are currently not available. The, these are the same data that were needed in 2007 and were not available then, and Gene has been, Gene has repeatedly reminded us, they, he's been promised those data repeatedly and we have not actually gotten that data. So it's very, very likely that the permit, the permit that we submit for will be interim again, uh, which means it will not be long term, it will be a short term uh, solution. Um, the state is likely to expand the requirements for environmental flow, habitat restoration, and the restoration of the historic conditions, uh, like we said, the, the herring runs. Um, it's, it's important to reiterate, Rick brought this up earlier, but the continued pursuit of the herring restoration and a better understanding of the water resources in town uh, are going to keep us as a model community within the state of Massachusetts and with all of our regulators. So it uh, really behooves us to continue this effort. And by the way, uh, we, uh, uh, the selectmen were asked to send us a letter of support for a priority project um, designation by uh, the, by the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife in the state. And we just found out today that's been publicly uh, acknowledged that we have been granted that. So Great. we will have continued support by the state. Great. Any other questions or discussions I'll take? Just to start off, I remember, I don't know, it was three years ago, maybe four, three, four, when, when we formed this committee. And I think we all knew at the time how important it was going to be. Uh, but it, it became much more important and meaningful uh, than even we thought. And I thank Elsie and I thank you and I thank everyone that, that uh, partaken in this because it's opened up a whole area that we uh, just weren't aware of. And, I, and uh, water was such an important issue where we said it three or four years ago and it's become even more an important issue for the town of Situate, the future of the town of Situate. So I, I can't say enough thank you from the board. In the town. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I'd like to turn that back uh, to you gentlemen and acknowledge the, the foresight in actually creating the committee and also the, the, uh, the, the persistent and constant support that we have felt uh, from you uh, it has enabled us to do the job that we have. And the committee is very pleased and very active, so we, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Comments from the board? It just, um, you know, it's, it's actually kind of fascinating trying to figure out how to um, regenerate, you will, if you will, the herring run again. And, uh, and so I'm kind of fascinated by the whole project and trying to see if there's some way to kind of do it in stages, which probably makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, a little long and short of it is that the town has an obligation to attempt to try to do the right thing, which is to try to bring it back. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly you've done a great job looking forward to trying to see if we can work on those solutions and Great. maybe we we'll, won't find the panacea right away but certainly work towards it so that we can we can achieve that yeah I think it's exciting I really uh, really excited to see if it can be done but well there'll be some challenges because very soon the committee is going to send me back with the recommendations that you've asked for and those recommendations are going to involve uh, expenditure of funds uh, and possibility of, uh, of passing uh, of, of bylaws mm -hmm. that will change the way we do business in the town that will have effect on people and those will be challenges that will require leadership and uh, I'm confident uh, again with the uh, track record that, that the Board of Selectmen has presented to us with that, that you guys are going to make that happen will help us uh, chase, chase the dream. What, one thing that's good about this, and just just one little thing, and you mentioned it almost in passing, but I want to make sure people really pick up on it. Dredging of the reservoir is not a solution. And we've all talked about that, and I've talked about that, and, you know, we've all sort of thought in an ad hoc way that, well, we can just deepen the thing, and that's going to hold more water. Well, this model clearly, clearly shows it. And then the way the model works is it's got different compartments. There's this much water in an aquifer. There's this much water in the reservoir. If you turn on the spigot and you move the amount of water, this amount from here to here, what's that going to have here and what's it going to do? And it very, very clearly shows that dredging the reservoir isn't an option. 
it's, it would probably make the, the situation worse. But now we know that, and we have numbers that, that back it up. So we're, we're able to move away from the ad hoc ideas that, for example, even I shared. Let's just dredge the thing, and we got a bigger bathtub. That, that holds more water, you know, we're hunky-dory. But so when we go to the town and we, and we explain that we're going to be changing these infrastructure or we're going to be doing this or doing that, we're going to have the, the, the hard data available to back it up. And that's this real quantum step forward, which is, which is just so delightful to work with um, from the management and predicting predicting way. And there's great synergy from Gene's and his group and the, and the committee and the state. It's pretty impressive when you have all these state people in there. And these are the ones that sign our permits, and they're all talking with these guys. <coughs> Right. And more recurrence was absolutely invaluable in terms of getting together all the different state groups. So, I mean, we have a lot, we've had a lot of help. Right. If I may, if I may add something, when, uh, as your water division supervisor, and um, maybe an ego problem I have of protecting my water supply and your water supply, more importantly. <laughs> I'm going to be the first one to admit that some three or so years ago when this whole project began, uh, I was not fully on board. I have undergone an attitude adjustment, <laughs> uh, and I now am convinced, and I hope this gives some comfort level to you all as water commissioners, that the objectives of, of the Water Resources Committee and the, these other groups that participated can be realized, the herring run can be restored uh, without sacrificing uh, the integrity of the public water supply and its drinking water purposes over the next several years. I think it can be done. Uh, it will not come uh, without work, but I, I am on board as your uh, water division supervisor in telling you all as commissioners that this process can go. Thank you. Thank you for those, for those words. And, and, and we mentioned earlier your retirement in, in March. It would not stop you necessarily from coming back as a volunteer to, <laughs> to add your expertise. With it. I know that that committee would certainly appreciate it, and, and we would also. But thank you, and thank you for those words. Thank you. Um, if we we are going to be going into an executive session where some of this uh, material may be discussed uh, in regards to another matter, so uh, is there any other questions for the board on what was presented? No, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, where are we? Other business. Other business? <clears throat> I, I have, well, I have it here just, Tony's brought up the, the, the liquor violation rules in the past, and I thought of it, I was going to mention it before the meeting, but I don't think we should let this die. I think we we'll let's. No. Uh, if we need copies of, of, of anything from Tony, let's get them, let's look at them, put it on the agenda, and, 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 and make some definite regulations, rather than wait for another violation, and then we're floundering again. That's all I'm saying. Right now, I, I spoke with Chief Stewart okay. before the holidays, and we decided to wait until after the holidays okay. to reconvene. Yep. I know John is going to, the three of us are going to get together with me with the Lieutenant Stewart. And what is, and what I was wondering on that note is, is there any way that we could get um, um, any of those bylaws in some form of like format, word perfect or word so that I have a packet of, of all of them, but. Uh, other than yeah. having to type them, I, I mean, yeah. it'd just be a lot easier to manipulate them from my standpoint. Oh, to, oh from to the be actual able to, document. You got yeah. it, instead yeah. of, I, I mean, I can scan them in, and, but the problem is they have to type them up. But, um, any event, that was my only. Yeah, I just thought it was you know, a great yeah. idea. And I, yeah, we haven't dropped the ball yet. So no, no, not yet. No. <laughs> and no, and I'm sure Would you, you just, won't. What, what is your plan to meet as a group? And I think John and myself and the, the chief and the lieutenant were going to get together and just kind of discuss it in terms of get, getting a guideline together to bring back to the board to say, here's what we see consistent policies are and some, some potential wording for our policies. And then there was also discussion between whether the violation was during a, a sting operation or just during a regular uh, course of business. So th those are the things we're going to try and get finalized. Okay. 
And create some options. I think the thought is, uh, you know, by looking at all the other towns and the, the city's uh, bylaws, um, we'll come up with a pr pr maybe a proposed uh, boilerplate and then from there look at the options so that we can take a look at them and, and say, yeah, I think that's something that the town should consider. And if not, then take it off the table. And there were about a half a dozen variables that the different towns did, like per violation per person or cumulative things or, um, um, you know, suspension at certain levels. So, you know, we'd have to kind of pick and choose which one of those makes sense for our community. Yeah, and sort of informal statute of limitations type right. deal. Like exactly. how far back do you count a pre-existing yep. condition? Thank you. Uh, Rick? Other I'm just going to chime in on something that, that Tony's, I'm going to let Tony take the lead on. We were both at the uh, school committee meeting last week, so I'll let him start off on that. Sure. Um, we went Other to than that, I'm, yeah, I don't have anything. Uh, school committee meeting um, about a week and a half ago where they presented their budget to actually a big crowd of people because they had the Latin um, group there uh, pitching for their programs. And um, so I think that was great because there were probably 100 people in the room mm -hmm. um, that heard uh, Chairman Johnson's um, presentation about the budget. The, the nuts and bolts of it were that um, it's about a $1.5 million deficit between the funding that they're going to receive and their budget. And they're trying to come up with creative ways to, to cut that gap. Um, they actually showed presentations of potential cuts in teachers, which is about um, where they are in terms of their availability of making up that, that amount of money. Um, but they really just reached out to the community to say what any options or any of any ideas that you have, please bring it forward to us so that we can um, look at it early enough to be able to implement it for this budget season. Um, so I thought it was very, very well presented and very well um, heard. I know they went and met with PTOs at all of the elementary schools and, and they're just trying to get um, the the whole details of the situation out to the public so that's no surprise when the upcoming year comes around and there are whatever changes have to be made. They didn't go into any details really in terms of what the changes are. They kind of looked at potential teachers and, you know, three at this school, five at this school, two at this school, but um, um, but that's where they stand. My, my take on this, on the presentation was, was uh, the school committee and Bill Johnston, in my opinion, are doing a fantastic job in terms of being 100% open and transparent with what these cuts are going to be and what the cut, cut scale is. And one of Bill's slides, and, and he's up there for the whole world to see, and they got the camera on Channel 22 and everything, is he had literally 18 different, I think it was 18, 18 different options that they are considering and nesting between, you know, well, if we do item four, it's going to save this amount of money. And just kind of like we were talking about with water, you know, how much water you're going to be able to move around and put an actual number on it. They said, well, if we cut X number of teachers, it's going to be this amount. We cut aids last year, so we really can't cut too many more aids because there aren't that many left to cut. But if we did, just for a number so we knew what it would be, it would be this amount of money. You can see right in front of you, well, that's just a, not enough money to do it. And uh, I, I mean, he's a very stand-up guy. The school committee is being very stand-up in terms of putting it forth and putting it right out for people to see. But the one sort of murmur that I kept hearing around the room was, well, geez, I, I you know, people's voices were like, geez, I didn't know it was going to be like this, or, or what's it going to be, or, or what's this going to mean? And so I just encourage everybody to um, enhance uh, to a greater level the amount of attention that you're paying to this issue, because $1.5 million is, is a very non-zero number. And there are going to be very, very real impacts on the way uh, the school is going to be next year. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, three, three years, years ago, ago. Was, was an override. And um, that has served its purpose and it had brought some great advantages to the town. But due to um, standard increases in um, various uh, line items, uh, the impact of that has essentially been eroded away financially, which is sort of the cost of doing business. That's how the system works. Whether an override is going to be brought forth or not remains to be seen, but there are other ways to, to look at this. But I just encourage people to